contrary to everybody. This self-contained paper will show that continued fractions are not only perfectly amenable to arithmetic, they are amenable to perfect arithmetic. The words of Bill Gosper in the early 70s resonate even today. For Gosper, it's likely that the appealing concept of perfect arithmetic may well have involved using continued fractions to perform calculations to any desired degree of accuracy. The examples we're going to explore here may offer a glimpse into one of the enduring questions regarding continued fractions. They are wonderful at representing numbers, both rational and irrational. But can they also serve as practical tools for computation? We're going to explore two different approaches to continued fraction arithmetic. An interactive tool based upon the original Gosper method and a potentially simpler matrix process. Some of the examples we'll look at involve simple finite rational values, but it's unlikely that anyone would realistically wheel in continued fraction arithmetic for such as these. But for those convoluted rationals, and especially those infinite irrationals, well, it was made for such as these. Let's begin with a brief overview of Gosper's continued fraction arithmetic. Gosper's continued fraction arithmetic process performs the basic mathematical functions plus, minus, times and divide on two continued fractions, x and y. It requires a 2 by 4 matrix in this implementation. The terms A12, A1, A2, A being the numerator terms, if you like, and the B terms, the denominator. This matrix carries arithmetic functions of the form Px plus Q over Rx plus S and ty plus u over vy plus w. The a terms correspond to the coefficients of the numerators and b terms the denominators of, in turn, x times y, x, y and a constant term. If that means very little to you, an example will help, I'm sure. So look at, let's look at these two linear fractional functions transformations. 3x plus 4 over 2x minus 1, so that's a linear function on x, multiplied by y plus 3 over 2y minus 1, a linear function on y. If we multiply those and expand them, we get 3xy plus 9x plus 4y plus 12 as the numerator, 4xy minus 2x minus 2y plus 1 as the denominator, corresponding to the matrix 3, 9, 4, 12, 4, minus 2, minus 2, 1. Hopefully that makes a bit more sense. Now with this process I can perform the following operations. Input the next term of continued fraction x, input the next term of continued fraction y, output a term of the continued fraction resulting from the operation. I output a term if the integer parts of a12 over b12, a1 over b1, a2 over b2 and a over b are all equal. Otherwise, I keep looking. I input another term from continued fraction x or continued fraction y. If I need a term from either fraction, but it has no more terms, you can think of, I inject infinity, but that's just in the empty continued fraction. Each input and output changes 
the internal state of the matrix. And again, at this point, that probably means very little until we see it in process. When I need to choose to input from X or Y, I act as follows. If B and B2 are both zero, I choose an X term. If B is zero, I choose Y. If B2 is zero, I choose Y. And if the absolute value of the difference between A1 over B1 and A over B is greater than the absolute value of the difference between the A2 over B2 minus A over B, I choose an X, otherwise I choose Y. At this point, you might begin to understand why this method isn't more widely popular. But let's have a look at it in process. Let's begin with the simplest of examples. Our linear fractional transformation is going to be simply the product of our two continued fractions, x and y. So we can enter as a, um, a four by two matrix, or a, more simply as an eight term array, or we can just type in a, a linear functional a fractional function. So let's use x times y. We're going to multiply two continued fractions together. Now as an eight term array, that's the four terms of the numerator followed by the four terms of the denominator. You might remember that the very first term is the coefficient of x times y. So that's a one because what we're doing is 1 times x times y. The next is the x term. That's 0 here, there's no individual x term. The next is the y term, the next is any constant added on. The next four terms are our denominator terms. Well, we're not, we haven't got any x times y terms on the bottom of a fraction. In fact, the only thing on the bottom of a fraction for this operation is a 1. We'll see some more of these and it, it does make more sense. All right, before we start with the big boys, let's try something a little simpler. So we're going to put in a simple fraction, 10 over seven. Our second, and you'll remember my, my dire word of warning at the start, you really wouldn't be using this operation for simple fractions. It's, it's a bit high powered for that, but to see what's going on, these are a good way to start. So let's begin with 10 over seven and 22 over five, and we're going to use Gosper's method to multiply those two fractions together. And before you start, I know multiplying them by normal methods is pretty simple. Step one, we begin with our original matrix, our two by four matrix, which we've already talked about. The leading one corresponds to x times y, and the only other term is a one on the bottom of the fraction. So this is the operation for x times y over one. Look at the bottom of the fraction, the, the denominator terms. Remember these are called b12, b1, b2, and b. Now b2 is zero, but b is not. So we're gonna choose our first input from y. Now you remember y was 22 over five as a continued fraction, four, two, two. So our first input term will be a four. Now that four transforms our starting matrix. And we'll see in a, 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 few, a couple of minutes how that works. Trust me for the moment. So it changes the matrix and produces a new form. What we do now, and we're going to get used to this, you look at each of the pairs, the vertical pairs of terms in the matrix as a fraction. We're interested in the, the values of the floor value of each of those fractions. So the first fraction is four over zero, okay, undefined. Next one over zero, next zero over one, and then zero over zero. As you can see, it's calculated as best it can. So the floor values, the floor of those infinity, infinity, zero, and not a number. That simply means that at this point, we can't begin to build 
our, our resulting continued fraction. We have to go back and get some more information. So we go to step two. This time we're starting with our new matrix that we just produced. We note that B is zero, so again we're going to input from Y. Now remember Y is the continued fraction 4, 2, 2. We've already taken the 4, we're now going to choose the next number, 2. So our input number is 2. It transforms our fraction again, and our floor values are still not all equal. We don't get to actually start to build our continued fraction until the four floor values are equal. So we keep going. Next time round, both our B and B2 terms are non-zero. So we go to the next test. Look at the absolute value of the differences between A1 over B1 and etc. And uh, in this case, the, lead, the A1 over B1 minus A over B is greater than A2 over B2 minus A over B, so we're going to choose from X. So our first term of our continued fraction for X is 1, so this time we're going to input a 1. And that produces a new matrix. Floor values 4, 4, infinity, infinity. We're getting closer. We keep going. This time we choose another input from X. So and it'll be the second X term. This is 2. It produces this new matrix, four values of 6, 6, 4, 4. A third choice from X means that our next input will be 3. And you see we're getting awfully close now. Finally, we choose, well it's not finally, there's more to do, we choose our next input from Y, and that will be the 2 value. And wow. So what, you're, what we've just done is to work through the six terms of the continued fractions, each uh, three terms each. And it's not till we've, we've actually worked through all six of those that we reach a point where we can output a term. Now the floor values you can see are all six. So our first output term is six. That's going to change our matrix from that, that one you see there to a new one. Now this tells us we want to submit an X term, but we've run out of X terms, so we simply do some changing of the matrix, again according to the rules. The rules are very important here. This produces a new matrix, which is no longer, the floor values are no longer equal, so we don't get to Put anything in at this point, we keep going. Our Y's are exhausted, but this does give us another set of equal floor values and our output this time is a 3. So our fractional result so far is 6 and 3. Now those are the first two terms of a continued fraction, which is our answer. And in fact, 6, 3 as a continued fraction is 19 over 3. What we're seeing here is that at each stage, when we have an output number, we're getting an approximate value for our final result and moving closer and closer each time. This time the floor values are all 2 and our output is a 2, so our result is 6, 3, 2, or the fraction 44 over 7. So our initial, our initial matrix of operation was the one at the top. Our final matrix of operation was 5s and zeros. It's okay that the 5 divided by 0, we can live with that as being infinity. And our final result is 632, or 44 over 7. And if you do some quick mental arithmetic, um, you'll probably agree that that's the, um, that's the product of 10 over 7 and 22 over 5. But it did seem an awfully long way to go about it. 
hence my my warning that it's not something to be used lightly. You probably wouldn't be looking at Gosper's continued fraction arithmetic for fractions like 10 over 7 and 22 over 5. Let's have a quick look. Having been through the process once now, let's look behind the scenes. So continued fractions have been around in some form or other since the time of Euclid. I believe Gosper's breakthrough uh, in seeing how they could be used arithmetically came from his ability to see the problem from both a mathematical and a programming perspective. Let's have a look at a, a simpler case, and this is a single continued fraction. So consider the square root of 37. Now the continued fraction of any quadratic irrational will be a regular periodic, will have a periodic form. In this case, 6, 12, 12, 12, and so on. Now it's also true that that can be represented in another form as a product of matrices. So if I have the continued fraction 6, 12, 12, 12, that can also be evaluated by multiplying these matrices. The first term 6, 6, 1, 1, 0, 12, 1, 1, 0, followed by more of the same. Starting at the left, if I multiply the two first matrices, I'll get my first convergent, my first approximation. I then multiply the next, and so on. Now if I wanted to do some arithmetic with square root 37, suppose I wanted to add 4 and divide by 7. Well that operation can also be expressed as a 2 by 2 matrix. Think of it as 1, 1 times root 37, 4, 0, 7. And we could of course, being a product of matrices, we could then put that linear fractional transformation at the start followed by the matrix form of the continued fraction and you could see in a matrix terms it's, it's much easier to see what's going on. So we'd multiply the first two and then each time we multiply by the next one we get closer and closer to our final result. This is another way of looking at what Gosper's approach is doing. It's easy to see how such a process can serve to generate successively more accurate results. In fact, essentially, to any desired degree of accuracy, and you're not hampered by the fixed accuracy of your calculating device. Because here we can see what the next term is going to be. It's always going to be a 12. So we can continue to multiply those matrices, and what we'll get is perfect arithmetic. By taking successive convergence, the process can continue for as long as desired, each new result progressively more accurate. Gosper used the term homographic to talk about functions of this form. Now the process that I've adopted here, um, having worked through Gosper's original article, which is freely available, it was never formally published, but is readily available online and linked from this website. Um, and I couldn't, I, I, yeah, I couldn't follow the, the details of it. It's not until I came across a site called Rosetta Code, where they were actually writing code to do Gosper's process and using multiple different coding languages to do it. Sadly, not JavaScript, which is what I was looking for, so I had to work that out myself. But as we just saw, the process can, uses two continued fractions, x and y, and a 2 by 4 matrix that we've already talked about. For example, look at the example matrix shown there, 0, 1, 1, 0 on the top, 0, 0, 0, 1. Can you see that that represents a very simple process? 
The leading zero means there is no xy term. The, the next one is an x term. Next one is a y term and there is no constant on the top. And on the bottom again, only a one. So this is actually the matrix form for x plus y. Hopefully I can almost hear the, the pin dropping as you go, oh, okay, yes, I can see how that works. We'll see some more examples in a minute that will help to make this a little clearer. As I described earlier, with this process, I can perform the following operations, input the next term of x, the next term of y, and output a term under the right conditions. I output a term if the integer parts of a12 over b12 and a1 over b1, in each of the four fractions contained in the matrix, once the, the integer parts are all equal, I can then output a term. Otherwise, I keep looking for terms from x and y. When I input a term from x, that acts upon the current matrix as shown there. If I input one, a term from x, but I have no x terms left, then it transforms the matrix as shown there. It's not hard. Same with y, there are slightly different transformations. And when I output a term, my matrix changes as follows. It seems a lot to take in, but notice one interesting thing. When I output a term, t, it takes the four denominator terms, the b terms, and they become the numerator terms. The numerator terms are a bit more complicated. They, they become the denominator terms, but effectively what you can see there is that when I output a term, I effectively turn my continued fraction upside down, or my, sorry, my matrix upside down and do some work on it. We saw the rules for um, f what happens with when choosing X and Y. Let's see if we can follow this. So our two by four matrix is shown when you apply two continued fractions, x and y, you get a new continued fraction z of that form. And again, let's go back to our, our simple examples. Let x be 10 over 7 and y be 22 over 5. But this time, we're going to do a little bit more work. Our last example simply involved calculating x times y. What we'll see is that even much more complicated operation in this case, as you can see there, 3x plus 4 over 2x minus 1 plus y plus 3 over 2y minus 1 is actually no harder than x times y. Expanding gives us that fraction, 8xy plus 3x plus 7 minus, 7y minus 7 over the denominator and you can now see how that transforms directly to our uh, two by four matrix. So the two by four matrix carries the arithmetic operations plus, minus, times and divide that we want to apply to our X and Y terms. Step one, we check out the matrix, decide that uh, the, the difference, the absolute value of the differences uh, the a1s are greater than the a2s, so I choose from x. x is the continued fraction 1, 2, 3, and I choose the first term as a 1. So input t is 1. That's what it's going to do to our leading matrix. That helps us to see where the new matrix comes from. We check the floor of each of the fractions they're not equal, so we keep going. Step two, here's our new matrix. Again, we're going to choose from x. So the next term we choose will be the next x term, or two. There's a two. You wouldn't want to be trying to do this in your head. 
But Gospel was writing at the dawn of the new computer age. His intention was to make computers better tools for doing mathematics with. Because remember, up to that point, and even today, computers are largely rational number machines. They're, they're decimal machines. They work in, well, fundamentally in binary, but they're not so good with exact arithmetic. This was behind Gosper's efforts, was to develop computer algorithms that would make them capable of exact arithmetic. So once more, we see our matrix is transformed according to the rule. We get a new matrix. Still, the floor is, the floors are unequal. So we keep going. This time, we're going to choose from Y. So our first Y term gets wheeled in. So far, we've put in 1 and 2 from X. We're now putting in 4 from Y, the first term. It transforms the matrix in that way. And our floor terms are 5, 4, 9, 7. Now, of course, as humans, this is pushing our patience. Computers are ultimately infinitely patient and will be doing this at a rapid speed. So that's the idea. We want to choose our next term next, and it completes our, our x terms. Now the floor, 5, 4, 5, 4, we're starting to get close. We put in our next y term, and bingo. Our numbers in the matrix are starting to get large. Don't panic. The computer can handle this, and so can we. Right, here's our first output term. It's a 5. So the first term, the first approximation of our result is 5. That's what this is saying. Now that transforms our existing matrix as shown there. You notice, as I observed earlier, the B terms, the denominator terms of the initial matrix become the numerator terms. And the numerator terms become somewhat simpler. Now we check. We need an x term, but there are no more x terms, so I simply apply my transformation when x is exhausted, and I get bingo. My next output term is a 2. 5, 2 is the start of our continued fraction of the result, and that's 5 and a half, or 11 on 2. Transforms the matrix as shown. This now pulls out our last y term. <clears throat> our floors are not equal, so nothing to, uh, no pay dirt this time round. But from now on, things start to get juicy. So our next output is a 2, and we get the next convergent, or 27 over 5. <clears throat> Step 9. The next output is a 3, 5, 2, 2, 3, or 92 over 17. Step 10 is a 2. And at that point, when we transform, you'll see we're going to stop because all the B terms are 0. We have our result, 5, 2, 2, 3, 2, or 211 over 39. Let's look at the process assisted by the computer. Remember, what we're working on is 3x plus 4 over 2x minus 1 plus y plus 3 over 2y minus 1. Two linear transformations for functions x, or computer continued fractions x and y. They generate our 2 by 4 matrix. We input our numbers and we begin the process that we've just done. Now, I won't take you right through it again, but you see what's going on, and we can cancel the jump to the final step.
And we see that the result 211 over 39, the convergence, this is the convergence are an interesting and relevant part of the package here. How quickly do we approach our result? In this case, it took four, five steps. Okay. By the way, the continued fraction for 211 over 39 is very nicely represented graphically in this way. You see the first term, 5, then 2, then 2, then 3, then 2. Okay, if you're still with me, congratulations. Welcome to GOSPA's Continued Fraction Arithmetic Process. Um, it's very cool. But I was tempted to see if there was, there might be a simpler approach. Thinking back to our, our first example, the product of matrices and continued fractions are naturally represented using matrices. Could we, perhaps, work in a different way? Once again, we'll begin with two linear fractional or homographic functions. This time we express them as matrices, call them N1 and N2. So, for example, 3x plus 4 over 2x minus 1 is the matrix 3, 4, 2, minus 1. And y plus 3 over 2 minus 1, 2y minus 1 is 1, 3, 2, minus 1. So we're avoiding GOSPA's 2 by 4 matrix and thinking of them as, the, as two individual matrices. Now N1 will interact with X, and again we'll keep using these examples, and N2 will interact with Y. So what's to stop us from basically step one, take the first term of matrix X, operate according to our N1, take the first term of matrix Y, operate using N2, and then combine those together. So 10 over 7, we know as a continued fraction 1, 2, 3, can be represented as the matrix product of those three terms, 1, 2, 3 in the leading terms. And when you multiply them out, the matrix you get has 10 over 7, the, the final convergent, as the first two terms. And in fact, it carries with it the last convergent, the last approximation, which was 3 over 2. So we know that 3 over 2 is a good approximation, and uh, 10 over 7 is the exact result. For 22 over 5, 4, 2, 2, when we multiply those three matrices together, we get 22 over 5, and we get 9 over 2 as the last, uh, the last convergent. So, okay, what if we wanted to add 10 over 7 and 22 over 5? Well, you, we know the process using normal um, arithmetic. How might we do it in this form? Well, I thought I was onto something until I realised that when you add two two by two matrices, um, you don't get the result that I was after. So if I take the matrix for 10 over seven, which is the first one, 10 over seven, three over two, and I add 22 over five and nine over two. Now matrix addition is very simple. It simply involves adding the corresponding terms. And sadly, that does not give us the answer that we're after. So, in mathematics, you're allowed to invent new things. Let's define some new matrix operations specifically for our job here. 
Now, multiplication and division of matrices, they're pretty close. You don't have to do much for them. Addition and subtraction are the problem. So we define um, Gosper matrix addition, which is a plus put in uh, brackets. And um, it basically just works out what A0 over A2 plus B0 over B2 would be, puts them in the first, the first and the third um, spots. I also cancel down just to make our life easier. That's part of the process. We can cancel them because these are no, our resulting matrix is no longer a continued fraction. It's simply a placeholder for two fractions. So using this process, I operate on 10 over 7, 3, 10, 3, 7, 2, and 22, 9, 5, 2. I get 2, 0, 4, 6, 35, 1. Turns out that 10 over 7 plus 22 over 5 is 204 over 35. The last result, the next, next convergent, is 6 over 1. So a good approximation for this is 6 over 1. Now that is no longer a continued fraction matrix. How do I tell? Continued fraction matrices have a special property. So let's go back. Right. Each of the terms, look at 10 over 7. Look at the matrix, the product for 10 over 7. It's 1, 1, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 0, 3, 1, 1, 0. If you find the determinant of each of those matrices, the determinant is, is simple. Multiply uh, the, um, the first and the last term, the first and the fourth term. Subtract the product of the second and the third term you get minus one. Now, multiply the two by the zero, subtract one, and you get minus one. That zero down in the fourth spot guarantees that, and the ones in the, um, in the other diagonal guarantee that each time you're gonna get minus one. But notice, when you get to the resulting matrix, 10, 3, 7, 2. 10 times 2 is 20, 3 sevens are 21, 10, uh, 20 minus 21 is minus 1. So it's, a, it's the real deal. It's an admissible continued fraction 2 by 2 matrix. Check out 22 over 5. Once again, the, one, the component matrices are obvious. Let's look at the last one. 22 times 2 is 44, 5 nines are 45, the difference minus 1. So Multiplying those matrices, uh, because they're all genuine continued fraction approved, gives you a genuine continued fraction result. However, when I do my special operations, the result I get is no longer a continued fraction matrix. And the reason is, is quite simple. Let's have a look at the, the top line here. Remember, the first matrix is our linear fractional transformation in two, 3x plus 4 over 2x minus 1. It's being multiplied by the continued fraction matrix 10, 7, 3, 2. But it's not a continued fraction matrix. That's the catch. 3 times minus 1 is minus 3, twice 4 is 8, Minus 3 minus 8 is minus 11, it's not minus 1. So because we're introducing an, a non-continued fraction matrix into our process, the result will not actually be a genuine continued fraction matrix. Okay, But that's not a problem, because all we want from that result is the answer to our question. So here... We, uh, we see our process worked out even further. The sum of the two matrices, we get 211 over 39. 
and uh, the last conversion was 83 over 16. The difference, 137 over 39. The product, 2146 over 507. And the, the, um, the quotient, dividing those two, well, you can do it as a division or you can invert the uh, divisor and multiply and you get that result. Now, using this matrix approach, it allows us to achieve what I believe is the intention of Gosper's process, perfect arithmetic, uh, increasingly accurate, we're converging to a um, uh, successive approximations. It takes the terms of the continued fraction, one matrix at a time, but it does so in a far more efficient manner. Because unlike Gosper's process, this only takes as long as the number of terms in your matrices, the number of terms in your continued fraction. So in this case, where we have three terms in each continued fraction, then we will arrive at our result in only three steps. The good bit, this process still works even with an unequal number of terms. Uh, so if we, all right, let's jump to an example. Let's try um, We'll use the same. Well, let's do a plus. Uh, what do we have? Y plus 3 over 2Y minus 1. All right. Now, we're getting the, given the choice. Do we want to use Gosper's method? Not this time, we'll use the matrix method. Now, let's put in um, 22 over 7 as our first one. And say, um, yeah, we'll stick to 22 over 5. Now, 22 over 7 as a continued fraction is 3, 7. It's got only two terms, 3 and 1 seventh. Uh, 22 over 5 we know is 4, 2, 2. Well, we can show the first few convergence. Step 1, uh, let's do N1 first. Our N1 is 3, 4, 2, minus 1. And we're going to multiply it by the first term of 22 over 7, which is 3. Gives us that result. Our first matrix is 13 over 5. Uh, our second matrix uh, is applied to 22 over 5, and uh, so it borrows the first term, which is 4, does the operation, and we get a 7. Now, using our special, specially defined arithmetic process of Gosper addition, 13, 3, 5, 2, and 7, 1, 7, 2 becomes 18 over 5, 2 over 1. So the first approximation for our result is 18 over 5. Now that's an error of about minus 3% from our true result. That's pretty good. We can do another step. Uh, we take the second term of our 3 and 1 seventh, 22 over 7, that's the 7. Uh, do the calculation. We do the second term of 22 over 5. Uh, we do the operation, and we've got our next convergent, 2059 over 592. The error percentage this time is 0.3 of a percent. We keep going. The first one doesn't change because we've run out of terms. All that means is we just keep revisiting the same result. We introduce our last term of our 22 over 5 
and we've arrived at our result. So the beauty of this process is it only takes as long as it takes to work through each of the terms of our continued fraction. Unlike Gosper's, which takes a long time to um, before you even start producing relevant terms. Now, in its to speak in its defence, Gosper's process is very precise. The terms that it outputs are precisely the terms of your resultant your answer, the continued fraction, which is your result. This method. It doesn't spit out, so look, in this case, our final result was the continued fraction 3, 2, 22, 1, 3, 2, 3, all right? Um, but along the way, it jumps through various other approximates. Now, because it's a continued fraction, those are very good approximations. Possibly not as quite as accurate along the way as Gosper's method, and that might be its only downside. But I'll leave it for you to think about and decide if um, if this might be an alternative that's a um, a more pleasing and uh, more accessible result. Lots of examples shown here, and what we've avoided up until now to give you a treat. Um, uh, the real deal. Suppose we want to work with irrationals, infinite irrationals. Well, let's take this example. So our process, again, we'll go back to the simple x times y or x gosper times y. Uh, and we'll use root 2 and root 3. We already know the answer. Root 2 times root 3 is going to be root 6. Let's see how Gosper goes about this. Now this is x times y, so we, we know in advance that the matrix is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, and a 1 on the end. Put in our root 2, put in our root 3. Step 1, I have to choose a term from y. Uh, and the first term of y is a 1, and as to be expected, we keep going, choose a term from x, the first term is a 1, and so on. Uh, we're just going to jump through. This will have, well, remember, although these are infinite continued fractions, uh, I've only limited it to, uh, I don't know, about uh, 16 decimal, 16 terms. So it would go through all of those and get closer and closer. We'll just jump to the end. And what we get is a very, very good approximation for the square root of 6. Now what if we use the matrix method? So again, summarises there. We'll look at the first few convergence. Well, the first term of square root 2 is a 1. Uh, so we multiply by 1. The first term of square root 3 is a 1. So the first term, not surprisingly, is 1 over 1. That's an error of just under 60% from the correct answer. On our second round, our error has reduced to 22.5% below. Like any good continued fraction, uh, in each in turn will be either above or below the final result. The next convergent gives us an error of about 4.7% and so on. So that's our approximation for square root 2 and square root 3. We perform our operation. 
and we get our result. Two, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four. And it's accurate up to our required 16 decimal places. And in fact, if we wanted to, we could quite easily keep going. Our convergence are all shown. And you'll see that the error is um, negligible from about halfway. So I'm open to um, comments and questions. Um, I'm certainly open to suggestions. Um, I, I suspect that uh, there may be issues that I haven't worked out uh, in this, uh, that make, makes this uh, possibly not as effective as Gosper's um, intricate approach. But it seems to me that if I was looking to do continued fraction arithmetic, I'd probably be looking at um, using the matrix method rather than um, uh, Gosper's, Gosper's um, original method. So um, your comments are welcome. I'll point out the page which is um, uh, linked from the, uh, the video. Also includes um, reference to Gosper's other creation of from the same unpublished paper, continued logarithms. And these are explored, um, I've explored these elsewhere on YouTube. So um, thank you for, for your patience in this. I hope there's been something that you've found of interest.